Welcome back to day eight of our chapter chats as we read The Wild Robot by Peter Brown. When we ended our story yesterday, spring was just starting to come to the island, and Roz had become wild. Let's jump back in. Chapter 62, The Return. It was a quiet afternoon on the pond, but the quiet was gradually being overtaken by sounds not heard around there for many months. The sounds grew louder and louder, and then a flock of geese appeared above the trees. Honk, honk, honk. Most flocks of geese move lazily through the sky and trail off in wobbly lines, but not this one. This flock was fast. It flew in perfect V formation, and it was led by a small, graceful goose. The flock flew once around the pond before gliding down and gently splashing into the water. The geese gathered in a tight group in the middle of the pond. They floated there for a while, softly honking to one another. And then the leader broke away from the others. He swam straight toward the nest, waddled into the garden, and fluttered up to his mother's shoulder. Welcome home, son, said Roz. It's good to be back, Ma, said Bright Bill. Chapter 63, The Journey. After months of separation, Roz and Bright Bill, mother and son, were together again, and they had so much catching up to do. They went into the nest, and the robot built a fire. Then the goose gazed into the flames and told the story of his winter. This is what he said. We spent the whole first day of our migration flying over the ocean. It seemed like the ocean would go on forever. But just when the flock was getting tired, Longneck pointed to some tiny islands on the horizon. We flew down to one of the islands and ate dune grass and rested our wings. After a few days of hopping from island to island, we reached the mainland and continued over fields and forests. And then... The snow began to fall. I'd never seen snow before, and at first I thought it was beautiful, but it just kept coming. The others explained that the snow was early, that we were never supposed to see it, but there it was, piled up around us as we tried to sleep at night. Longneck worried that the weakest geese wouldn't survive, and he was right. We lost old Widefoot to that very first snowstorm. We tried to fly around the snowy weather, but we got completely lost, and the weather became even worse. Lakes and ponds and rivers began freezing over. We couldn't find food or water, so we ate snow, and that only made us colder. We had trouble cleaning ourselves, and our feathers became dirty and heavy. The flock was in bad shape, but Longneck kept us moving. We are geese, he squawked, and geese keep moving. One day, we were struggling through a snow shower when we saw something called a farm. It had perfectly square fields and enormous buildings, and stomping her way through the farm was a robot. She looked just like you, Ma. Longneck sent me over to speak to the robot, but I couldn't understand anything she said. So I just followed her through the farm and around a corner, and then I saw something I never expected. Plants! Bright and colorful plants! I didn't understand how plants could live in such cold weather, but then I saw that they were actually inside a building. I learned later that the building was called a greenhouse, and it had clear walls made of something called glass. The robot pressed a button on the wall, and a door slid open, and warm air came rushing out. I hadn't felt warmth in so long that I just had to follow her inside. Ma, it was like summer in there. The air was warm and sweet and sticky. And there were rows and rows of different plants. The robot didn't pay any attention to me, so I wandered around the greenhouse, nibbling on leaves and drinking from puddles. Then I heard a scratchy voice behind me. <clears throat> if I were younger, I would have killed you by now. I spun around, and there was an old cat. She walked on stiff legs, and her fur was gray and clumpy. The cat's name was Snooks, and she didn't seem very nice. But then she saw the other geese out in the cold with their faces pressed against the glass, and she told me how to open the door. "'You can rest here,' said Snook, as the flock hurried in, "'but stay out of sight. The humans aren't as friendly as me.' None of us knew what humans were, but we didn't care. We were just happy to be out of the cold. Loudwing was so happy she cried. The flock drank and ate and bathed and slept and stayed out of the way. Snooks showed us how to leave our droppings so that they wouldn't be noticed, and for a few days, the greenhouse was our home. Once or twice a day, the robot would go outside and return with a box or a bag, but most of the time she stayed inside and quietly worked on the plants. 
There was a barn that I just had to explore. It was filled with animals and machines and piles of straw and two robots. One robot was fixing a broken door when I walked in. She was using a large spinning tool called a saw. She pushed the saw through a long piece of wood and dust shot into the air. Everything was going smoothly until the saw suddenly lurched forward and sliced right through three of the robot's fingers. But she was fine. A minute later, there was a flip sound as she popped on a new hand. Then she went right back to using the saw again. The other robot worked with the animals. Chickens, sheep, pigs, and cows. They were all caged in. The chickens kept asking me how I'd gotten out of my cage. I was explaining that I'd never had a cage when I heard panicked squawks coming from the greenhouse. I ran back and found that a human had discovered the flock. We didn't know what he was saying, but he looked really angry. Longneck tried to defend us. He got in front and spread his wings and honked, but the human wasn't afraid. He pulled out a shiny stick and pointed it right at Longneck. Snooks hissed, Look out! He's got a rifle! Suddenly, a bright beam of light shot out of the rifle, and Longneck slumped to the floor. He was dead, Ma. The flock was so scared, we fluttered around and honked and knocked over plants, but the human kept moving toward us, pointing his rifle. So I pecked the button to open the door, and we ran outside into the cold and flew away from there as fast as we could. Without long neck, the flock needed a leader. Everyone wanted me to lead. I didn't know what to do, so I started by repeating long neck's words. I squawked, we are geese, and geese keep going. When I took the point, the flock spread out behind me. The weather had us all turned around, and nobody knew which way to go, so I just led us straight south. We saw more robots and humans and buildings, but we didn't stop. We knew we were way off course, but we saw the ocean again. But at least it was a little warmer by the water, so I decided to follow the coastline for a while. There were more buildings by the coast. Most of them were on land, but some were in the ocean. The ocean buildings were dirty and crumbling and leaning in different directions. There weren't any humans or robots in those buildings, only sea creatures. We saw ships on the water. We saw ships on the land. We even saw ships in the air. They buzzed through the sky like giant dragonflies. And then we reached a place called a city, where thousands of buildings and robots and humans and ships were all close together. When we stopped to rest on a rooftop, we met a friendly pigeon named Greybeak. She had grown up there, so she knew everything about the city. She flew us over towers and under bridges and kept us away from all the buzzing airships. And everywhere we went, there were robots. Some of the city robots were just like you, Ma, but others crawled on six legs or rolled on wheels or slid up and down the sides of buildings. Some robots were really small, and some were really big. They moved things and cleaned things and built things and did every kind of job you can think of. Greybeak brought us down to a ledge on the side of a building and told us to look through the windows. Inside was a family of humans, and they had a Rosbot. When we looked into other buildings, we saw other humans with other robots. Every human seemed to have a robot. I told Greybeak about Yuma, and she wanted to show us one last place. We flew out to the edge of the city to a really big building called a factory. Greybeak brought us to the roof window, and we looked down into the factory and saw machines building sparkling heads and torsos and limbs. The factory was building robots. A machine held up a robot torso and put two legs under it and then snapped into place. It put feet under the legs, and they snapped into place. It snapped arms into shoulders and snapped hands into arms. A head was snapped onto the top, and the robot was finished. Ma, the robot looked just like you. I think that factory is where you were built. I wanted to watch more robots being built, but it started snowing again, so we said goodbye to Greybeak and continued flying south. We saw fewer robots and humans and buildings and ships. The air became warmer, and the snow disappeared. We started seeing other flocks of geese in the sky, so we followed them to the middle of a wide grassy field where there was a lake and hundreds of other geese. We had finally reached the wintering ground. After all we'd been through together, our flock had become very close. We kept to ourselves, eating and resting and remembering the geese we'd lost. But after a few weeks, we began to mingle with the other flocks. We met geese from all over the world, and they told us about their homes and their migrations and their troubles with the winter weather. Every flock had lost geese on the way there. A few flocks didn't make it at all. 
Before we knew it, the early spring flowers were poking up and it was time to fly home. We followed the usual migration route north. We flew over fields and forests and hills, but we didn't see any signs of humans or robots. And that was fine with us. Eventually, we reached the ocean, and then our island, and then our pond, and then I saw you. Chapter 64, The Special Robot After Brightbill told the story of his winter, he and his mother sat in silence and thought. They thought about poor Longneck and the human who had killed him. They thought about farms and cities and factories. They thought about Roz and where she truly belonged. Then, after a while, Roz told Brightbill her own winter story. She spoke of her long, dark hibernation, of how she had woken up to find the nest caved in around her. She spoke of blizzards and forest animals. She spoke of the many lodges she had built and the one that caught fire. But she mostly spoke of all the new friendships she had forged. I used to think that you were the only animal who would ever care about me, she said to her son. I worried that without you around, I would be alone again. But I was not alone. In fact, I made new friends, all on my own. I think the other animals might actually like me. Of course they like you, Ma, squawked the goose. You're the most likable robot I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot. It was true. Bright Bill had seen hundreds of different robots that winter, and none of them were anything like Roz. None of them had learned how to speak with animals, or had saved an island from the cold, or who had adopted a goose. As he sat there, watching the robot's animal gestures and listening to her animal sounds, Bright Bill realized just how special his mother really was. Chapter 65 The Invitation Roz was the first to arrive at the next dawn truce. She had an important announcement to make. The robot patiently waited in the great meadow as the sky slowly brightened and the animals slowly gathered. And once everyone was milling around and chatting, Roz began speaking in her perkiest voice. Pardon the interruption, if I could please have a moment of your time. The crowd settled down and listened to their robot friend. We made it through a terrible winter. A new generation of youngsters is arriving, and my son, Bright Bill, has just returned to the island with his flock. I think we can all agree that there is much to celebrate. So, in addition to the dawn truce this morning, I would like us to have another truce this evening. We can call it the evening truce, or better yet, the party truce. The crowd began chattering with excitement. I have planned a celebration, Roz continued, and you are all invited. I will take care of everything. Just please meet back here at dusk. Oh, and I have a little surprise. Actually, it is not little. It is quite large. The point is, I have planned a celebration, and I hope to see you all there. Sounds great, Roz, but I'm afraid there's one problem with your plan. Mr. Beaver blinked his beady eyes. The moon won't be out this evening, so it'll be too dark for us to see. You are half correct, said Roz. Tonight will be moonless, but it will not be dark. I promise. Now, if you will excuse me, I must prepare for our party. I will see everyone back here at dusk. Goodbye.